Hi, my name is Stephanie Hertz, Marketing Director here at Workforce Retirement Community. Workforce is the premier sponsor for Lifelong Learning Society, and we welcome you to the Riverside Lecture Series. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Barry Rumble. Barry earned his Bachelor of Science degree in Pharmacy from West Virginia University. Over his 36-year pharmacy career, Let's go he spent the last 29 years focusing on the care of older adults. He is the manager of Ambulatory Clinical Pharmacy Services for Riverside Health System. And in his current role, he oversees Riverside's pharmacy operations and long-term care consulting and clinical pharmacy services and ambulatory care. Barry has been a member of the American Society of Consultant Pharmacists for over 24 years and has served on multiple committees, including Transitions of Care, Senior Care Pharmacy, Educational Affairs, and Antimicrobial Stewardship. He has served as a geriatric preceptor for five schools of pharmacy, most recently Virginia Commonwealth University. He has been involved in research and has participated in numerous pro research projects over his pharmacy career on a variety of topics involving older adults. In his role in the Geriatric Assessment Clinic, Barry completes comprehensive medication reviews for patients with dementia or memory loss and provides education and therapeutic recommendations to patients, their caregivers, and primary providers. Today's lecture is entitled, Comprehensive Medication Reviews, What Is It and Why Do It? Please welcome Barry Rumble. Uh, thank, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you all for being here and those who are, who are listening um, in, at their homes or, or offices. Um, again, as they said, I've been around pharmacy for a long time. Most of it has been in geriatrics. I've done hospital, I've done retail. I've done a little bit of everything since pharmacy. Um, I knew very early on what I wanted to do. I started working in a pharmacy when I was 12. That was back in 1967. And I've been pretty much associated with pharmacy no matter what I've been in since then. Uh, today's topic, hopefully we'll share with you some of the details about what a comprehensive medication review is, what it involves, how a pharmacist goes through the medications with you, and coming up with a plan for how we're going to make changes, if any, in the medications that you're currently on and talk about that process. Um, again, if you've got questions, please just yell at me and, I'll, and we'll stop and we'll talk about them. Okay, so again, comprehensive medication review. What is it? Who wants it? Throughout this talk, I'm going to use CMR. It's easier than keep saying comprehensive medication review the whole time. A comprehensive medication review or CMR is defined as an encounter conducted face-to-face -face or via telehealth between a patient and a pharmacist. My bias here is I'd much rather do it face-to-face. -face. I want the person in front of me so we can sit down and actually talk. It's a lot easier to do it. The pharmacist collects patient-specific information to identify medication-related issues and create a plan, which is called a map, to resolve them alongside the patient and or provider. The nice thing about a CMR is if it's, it is done face-to-face, -face, it involves me and you talking or my colleague, Dr. Jennifer Purdy, actually talking about issues. It allows us to open open-ended questions. It allows us to explore some options or avenues we might normally not do that. Then what the information we gather from this, and we'll talk about later, we actually will send to the provider for their assessment and review because I'm only a consultative service. I don't have any power to change any of the medications you're on. I can only make recommendations. What are the patient benefits for completing a SAMR? Why are you going in and meeting with your pharmacist? It's a medication assessment. We look at everything that you're taking, prescription meds, over-the-counters, herbals, vitamins, supplements, we ask you to bring everything in with you, okay? We want to determine if it's appropriate, effective, at treating the medical conditions and achieving what we're trying to do as far as your overall health and care. It's a personalized therapy. Again, it's customized to meet the needs of each individual patient. It's not a cookie cutter box method where what goes in goes out for everybody. It is totally individualized, individualized and unique to you. Collaborative practice, healthcare professionals work together to offer optimal patient care. I've had the, the privilege with Riverside to work with some really good people. Um, if, you, if 
at the Geriatric Assessment Clinic in Williamsburg, we have a master's in social work who's very knowledgeable. She knows more things about dementia than I probably ever will know. Uh, we have an RN who works with us, and we have a physician that's certified in geriatrics and also one who's been working with that population for a long period of time. At the Memory Care Clinic for Hampton Neurology, basically the same type of thing. We still have that master's in social work. We have an RN and we have a nurse practitioner that's trained in neurology and also knows geriatrics as well. So we have a pretty good group of people sitting down, listening to what's going on before we make decisions or offering information to you. Patient engagement. Involving patients in discussions and decisions regarding their medical care allows them to take ownership of their health, promoting and imp improve outcomes. And it is, you are totally involved. We sit and we talk for a fair amount of time. Sometimes in our memory care clinics, the person we're doing the CMR for is not cognitively intact enough to really give good valid answers. They're still part of the conversations. They're still part of the meeting, but usually it's the caregiver, the spouse who provides most of the information for what goes on in a daily, the daily lives. Ongoing regimen reviews, patients are periodically reassessed for changes in medication regimens, control of symptoms, and progress towards the goals. In both places, we, they do schedule follow-up appointments, so we don't really do this a whole lot. Um, we see them as we need to. There are some people based upon our recommendations and what's going on with them, we do ask to see them back within a couple of months just to see how things are going. But you're always available to us. Uh, we are part of the team in both places. And if you ever want to talk to Barry, like I tell them, you is, just call and say, I want to talk to that guy pharmacist. And that guy pharmacist will show up and we'll, we'll talk because I'm the only guy pharmacist. So it makes it a little bit easier. Improved outcomes. What we're hoping to do is have improved medication adherence and get greater control of chronic diseases, reduced hospital admissions, reduced ED visits, and reduced unscheduled office visits. All this should hopefully enhance a patient's quality of life. And that's what we're trying to do. Reduce costs, patients only pay for medications, over-the-counters and herbal products that are deemed necessary for their health. The improved medical medication adherence and decreased adverse effects, hopefully reduce a reduction in hospital admissions, ED visits and overall healthcare visits. And again, last thing is just increased satisfaction. Components of the medication assessment. Again, this assessment usually takes half an hour to an hour. Sometimes it takes more. Usually when I'm in front of you, it takes for as long as you want it to be. Um, we've had some of these that went an hour and a half, two hours before we try to keep it to about an hour, but it can be more. You, you need to understand that before we ever sit down with you to meet, we've spent at least a half an hour to an hour going back and gathering some ground and working information from you. So we have some idea of what's going on before we even sit down to talk with you. And we'll go through that process a little bit later in the slides. But we do spend a fair amount of time pre-appointment getting to know you. Patient preparation again. We tell you to collect and bring in all your medications, both prescriptions, OT pro OTC products, any devices such as inhalers or insulin pins with you. We want to see with in inhalers and pins, are you able to use them correctly? If you're not able to use them correctly, then we need to make some changes because you're not getting optimal therapy with those medications, which may be leading to some problems that you're seeing. It's important to include all vitamins and herbal products, as some of these cause significant drug interactions. Uh, my bias, and I'll tell you early on, and you're going to hear it later, is I really think that we don't need most of these products. Um, they've never been shown to really work a whole lot. We can't even guarantee how pure they are and what strength they actually are because they don't go under any really significant testing. Patient-specific, what's for you? Does the medication list agree with your personal health record? Here especially, we have multiple health systems. We have multiple specialists. We have multiple pharmacies, multiple providers. What we, one of the reasons why you, we ask you to bring everything in, because if you bring everything in that you think you're supposed to be taking, that list should match up what's in your elect, electronic health record. For the vast minute of the majority of the time, it doesn't. So we go through that. And we try to figure out why things aren't on there, why are things on there. So when we're done, 
we have a good idea of what we truly think you're on. Then we can make decisions based upon that, because if we're not sure, we shouldn't be making any decision. We don't know what you're, what you're really on. The indication for use, we'll ask you that. That's the other reason why we bring your medicines in, because we'll lay them out there and I'll say, can you tell me what this is for? Can you tell me what this medication is for? And I hopefully you'll be able to tell me, and I always joke with people and say they can reach out and have a lifeline and ask the person that's with them if they know what it's for. The reason why we do that is there are studies that show if people know why they take their medications, they are more likely to take them every day. If you don't know what the medications are for, they're not as important, and people don't tend to take them like they should. So we're looking to see, do you really know? Has your provider told you what these medications are for? We're looking for that. Is the medications effective in, in treating the condition? So we're going to ask you, do you think they're working? Not working. How do you take each medication? Because sometimes that's important. Do they feel, make you feel worse? Because we'll have a lot of people say, yeah, ever since I started that medication barrier, I just don't feel the same. Well, we need to know that. And your doctor needs to know that. Okay. Have you noticed any side effects, anything peculiar going on? And we'll talk about some of those as we go through the slides as well, since you've started the medication, because that's something that you need to be aware of. Anytime you start a new medication, you start to feel a little bit different, you need to let somebody know. Because it could be the medication and it probably is. Monitoring if appropriate. Are, there, are you supposed to be doing special things to monitor the effectiveness of the medication? Are you doing those? Are you having any difficulty in remembering when to take your medications? And if so, there may be some things out there to take. Um, and especially in today's world with everything that's going on, as, as complex as it is, and with COVID still around, it is hard to remember to take things. Um, I can share with you real quickly, for a period of time, I was on one medication, one medication only, and I can never remember to take it, and especially at the time I was supposed to. So the only way I could remember to take it was at 5.30 in the morning with my first sip of coffee. If I didn't do it then, I didn't do it. And I'm a, I'm a pharmacist and I know better. And I still didn't do it right. Duration of therapy. As we go through life, we have little things that happen to us. They go away. The medication you're on, is it still appropriate? Or is that problem went away and you still are on the medication? So we look for those types of things because it happens all the time. The dose and frequency, is it appropriate based upon age and renal function? Two things that you have to remember, and if you come to any of our clinics, you'll hear it. One is, as we get older, our brain does shrink. That's just normal aging, so that does some cause some confusion, some forgetfulness. It's the person like me who goes to the refrigerator at 1230 in the evening, opens it up, closes the, back, the door back because I can't remember what I was going for. I take two steps and go, ah, the iced tea, and then I, I go get the iced tea or you put your car keys down and you can't find them, but you're able to retrace your steps and find them because I never put them in the same place twice, never. Um, so it's those types of things. The other thing is your, your renal function, your kidneys. Once you reach the age of 40, they decline in their effectiveness by 0.8 to 1% per year. And that's just due to normal aging. So at 67, I've lost 27%, my best renal function ever. It's not a big deal. That's part of aging. Um, if you add insult to that and you have diabetes and you don't control it, or you have hypertension or you have something else and your kidney function falls even more than that, then it becomes a problem. But there are some medications as you reach a certain age, the dose changes or how often you take it changes in the same way with renal function. And we'll get into a couple of those that we see more common later in the slide. Allergies, assessing allergies. This is a big problem and we try to work through that. There is a difference between al a true allergy and a side effect. If it's a true allergy, it's, you get massive swelling, you can't breathe, you start having arrhythmias with your heart, that's an adverse effect. Nausea, vomiting, a little confused, that's a side effect. We need to differentiate between those. Down the road, that could affect what medications we can use on you and we may want to use a drug that has less side effects, but you're telling us you're allergic to it. In reality, you're not. You just had a side effect. So we try to tease out, is it truly an allergy or is it just the side effect of the medication? Because they all get thrown together in your chart. So we need to find out which is which. 
Does the patient chew or crush their medications? That's important in today's world with sustained release products with those that you can't break in half or you can't crush, can't chew. Because if you're doing that with your medication, you're not getting the full benefit of the medicine. You're increasing your risk for side effects very early on because all that medicine goes into your system. And later on, there's nothing to help prevent anything happening from why you're taking it. Assessing medical adherence, medication adherence. One of the think, things we do is, and the other reason why I bring, ask you to bring your prescriptions, we do two things. One is if you have a local pharmacy, it's easy to do. If you're getting it through the mail, it's almost impossible to tell whether you're taking your meds correctly or not because they send stuff pretty much whenever they want to now. But if you're getting going down to your local Walmart, the day before, I usually will call up and say, hey, look, I'm seeing this patient in clinic tomorrow. Can you give me some history on their medications and how they get, how often they get them refilled? And usually I'll pick three or four. He's busy and I don't want to bother them for the whole list of meds. And if it's a 30-day supply and you haven't gotten this filled for four months, that tells me you're not taking the medications the way you should. Or if it's a 90-day supply and we're now day at 112 and you still have got medicine in the bottle, that means you're not taking it correctly, okay? I need to know that, and your providers need to know that because I can't make any changes with your meds because I don't know if you took them correctly what we would be seeing, and I don't want to increase something or decrease it when you're not taking it the way you should be taking it. Physicians, providers don't always ask that question. Do you take your medicines? Or they'll or, yeah, I take my medicines, but you don't. So they're basing it all on the fact that if you're on two antihypertensives and your blood pressure is still not controlled, they're going to put you on another one or they're going to increase the strength of one of the others. So we really need to know whether someone's taking them or not. The other reason why I have you bring them in is on every prescription, there's a date that you got it refilled. So even MedExpress and some of those, I can go back and sort of look, say, wait a minute, this is a nine day supply and you got it filled six months ago. Why are there still tablets? In so we're able to assess adherence. Is the patient taking their medication or not? That is critical before we do anything else. Dispensing of daily medications. How do we do that? Do you have 15 meds and you take them out of the kitchen cabinet or the bathroom cabinet and set them down and take off the lids of the vials and put pills in your hands and take them? Do you put them into a med planner, pill dispenser, an automated machine? How do you actually get ready to take those medications. Who picks up the refills? And this is especially important in our population where we see with, with dementia, because it'll be the person who has mild or moderate dementia or cognitive impairment. Oh, I, pick, I pick them up. Ooh, okay, maybe, maybe not. Probably may or shouldn't be driving at, at that point. So we look to see who actually is picking them up. Or I've had a couple of cases where the, the patient's there and the two children are there and he says, oh, you get them. No, you get them. Okay, which one actually gets them? Because they're saying that the other one actually gets the meds. We need to know who's picking up the refills. Are there any problems with your current medication regimens? Are you having any problems that you're aware of that we can look at and address? Lab monitoring. Are there any labs that you should be doing fairly frequently or any home testing? We ask for that as well. The magic wand. That's, that's my favorite one, and I don't. I have a pen, and I'll say, okay, this is a now magic wand. If I give you this magic wand, and you can do anything at all with your medications, what would you do differently? And then I listen to the response. If I get someone says, I'm taking too many, too many medications, and I only really want to take what I'm taking, or I like to get rid of all of them, I have someone that if I'm thinking already that we have changes we can make, it's going to be a lot easier to do. If I get the person who says, I think everything is fine. I don't know why I'm here. I'm going to keep taking these because the doctor told me I'm like, ha I have to take these for the rest of my life. That's going to be a little bit harder of a challenge, trying to maybe get them to reconsider some of their, their options. Physicians, not, and I give this talk to doctors periodically, we shoot ourselves in the foot with that because we should never say you're on this for life because that's not true. You might be, but you might not be. So when they say that, they already put up a barrier for any interventions because the doctor told me I'm on them for life. We try to work around that as well. And then we come down after we do all that, we have recommendations based upon 
that interaction that we had during this MR. Why do we do them? Again, my bias, and I will always tell you my bias. In the United States, compared to any other country in the world, we use more medications, more vitamins, more herbal products than anybody else in the world. We have a drug for everything, and we use them. We use them a lot. I'm going to talk about that. There are two catchphrases in the literature. You hear, see where they talk about polypharmacy and polymedicine. And I laugh because when I read these articles, I have authors who use them interchangeably, and they're not the same at all. The first one really is polymedicine. It's the use of multiple medications to treat diseases and other health conditions. It is usually defined by five or more routine med meds and two or more chronic medical conditions. It is more common in the older adult, many of whom have multiple chronic conditions such as arthritis, asthma, COPD, heart disease, depression, diabetes, and hypertension. If you have even three of those, we'll say you have COPD, diabetes, and hypertension, you could, according to current guidelines, be on 10 medications to treat those, okay? If you require max treatment. If you're using those 10 medications to actively treat chronic illness and you're monitoring them, and there's nothing in there, no duplications of therapy, nothing that you can see wrong, that's polymedicine. That's just the medicines you need to take care of your chronic illness, okay? We're gonna to try to mess with them a little bit. We always do, but they're really needed. Adults age 65 and older tend to take more medications than any other, any other age group. 83% of US adults in, in their 60s and 70s have used at least one prescription medication in the previous 30 days. And about 33 to 40% use five or more prescription medications daily. This is the United States. This number is probably a little conservative. It's act, I've seen reports where it's actually in the mid 40s, going towards 50. Most of the medications we use are for cholesterol, hypertension, diabetes, for the most part. Why we look at those medications, especially two, is one is for control, but especially hypertension and, and diabetes and, and cardiovascular drugs, those are the ones that push people into the emergency rooms because of acute problems. Those, that's what we're looking for because we're trying to keep that from happening. Polypharmacy, and this should be really the true definition of polypharmacy, in my opinion, is the inappropriate use of excessive or unnecessary medication. You, ha you have increased risk for adverse medication effects, including falls in cognitive impairment, harmful drug interactions and drug disease interactions in which medications prescribed to treat one condition worsen another or cause a new problem. Case being, um, take a medication and one of the side effects of it is, oh, we'll take a diuretic, we'll take furosemide. You take furosemide 40 milligrams daily and it depletes potassium. So your potassium level falls below normal. They put you on a potassium replacement to get your potassium back up. A couple of weeks into that, it causes irritation to the stomach. It can cause some heartburn, some reflux. So you go in. Now they put you on a proton pump inhibitor to take care of your heartburn, your, your reflux symptoms. Well, the proton pump inhibitor also has its side effects. So you can get on three or four medications because of what the Lasix did to begin with, which we probably should have changed it to something else to maybe prevent that from occurring. That's called a cascade effect. We see it all the time where one medication is started and four other medications get started because of the original problem that was never addressed. 2016, it was estimated that prescription drug related morbidity and mortality related to non optimized medication regimen costs the US more than $500 billion annually. That was in 2016. I've not seen any recent numbers. I looked before we did, I couldn't find anything more recent than that. That's a lot of money because of adverse medication side effects. CMR requires good clinical decisions, which requires good data before making any recommendations to a provider. The clinical pharmacist should attempt to collect the most accurate medication use information using all available resources. Discrepancies and inaccuracies can occur in any setting in which the medication review takes place. We're aware of that. We try to prevent that from happening by the way we do our, our CMRs. Unfortunately, in the United States, uh, MedD plans allow you to have an MTM Esther CMR yearly, but you have to meet this criteria. 
You have to have multiple chronic diseases. You have, an, have to have an estimated annual cost for covered Part D meds over $4,255. And you're on multiple Part D meds. With the MTM program and the CMR, they primarily target, as we talked about before, diabetes, heart failure, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. The only other way you can pay for this is out of pocket. I cannot bill you for any services that I do. You go into a retail store, they can bill you because they're billing you for the cost of the medications or service. I am not licensed in this country. I'm not on the Social Security Act to be able to bill for any of my services. So I have to tie in with the provider and bill it under their services to get reimbursed. So it usually comes out of, out of pocket because most providers don't want to share their money with anyone. And that's understandable, especially in, in today's world. So it would cost you money to do that. Um, most of my, some of my friends who do this, they usually charge, if you want to know, somewhere about $100 that first appointment. If I was realistic, we're going to spend one to one and a half hours or longer with you at the meeting, and we spend that half hour to an hour before the meeting. So we've spent at least a good two hours or more getting ready for this meeting. So follow-up meetings are usually $50 because they're usually a lot less to go over. We're just checking how things are, are going. The other problem with this is again, if you do it right, you want to be able to make changes at that point in time. If you're visiting that patient, you don't want this to go to, to a provider who may not see you for six months from now, and they may have not gotten my email or my fax, or by that time, they, it's under 3,000 other sheets of paper and they totally forget about it. You wanna be able to do something immediately. Virginia, you can do that. It's a collaborative practice agreement. It has to be provider specific, each provider that we would do, I'd have to go to them to get authorization to do that. You'd have to go through this whole checklist, has to go through legal to make sure I can do it. So it's really hard to do that in a lot of cases. That's why it's much easier to see them at the geriatric assessment clinic or to memory care clinic because we actually are part of a doctor's visit because we do have physicians there actually seeing patients as well. So we're able to bill for our, for our service. This is what this looks like. Um, it, and it basically, it's a sheet of paper. Um, there are multiple forms out there. I don't use them. I like my own. I've been doing it for so many years. And, and also this allows me room to circle things and make scrawl marks and draw things if I do it this way. What I'm basically looking for, this is blank for the most part when I start. And we put in the patient's name, which they say it's me. I'm not 78, not yet. I'm only 67, but we, I want their age. I want to know where they live. I want to know again what their allergies, allergies are so that I can tease out whether it's a truly allergic reaction or it's a side effect, or is it something that's not on there or it's on there and that the patient has no idea because they've never had a reaction. And that happens all the time. People get allergies put on their chart that they're not truly allergic to. They've never had a problem. So then we take it off of there. It's not an allergy. Again, we want to know, again, their provider, who it is. The initial visit, we want to know how tall they are and how much they weigh. We want to know if they're coming in into the, our one of our clinics to look at cognitive impairment or cellular cognition. We want to know what the previous score was. If, they, if we've seen them, if it's initial, we want to know because we'll give a MOCA score. We'll do a MOCA test while they're there. And I want to know what that score is because that can affect how I'm going to do things. I want to know what the farm is. And I apologize. I looked at these slides twice. I missed some things. And the person who looks at them also missed them. So there are some typos. Also on here, I have a place for the pharmacy phone number in the pharmacy. So again, I know it's Walmart. It's this number. And when I have a chance, I'm going to call them and ask about, about that information. All right. Again, my name, address, pill planner. I'm going to ask you, do you use a pill planner? Yes or no? And if no, I'll, then again, we'll know what, what you use. So pill planner, is it a one week, two week? Is it only AMs and PMs? Is it split out for three times a day, four times a day? We're going to ask you who actually fills, who sets up, this, there's one of my typos. We're actually going to ask you who fills that for you? Who puts the meds in the pill planner? It's the person who has some degree of cognition, impairment in their cognition. They can still do that, but at that point, somebody needs to go behind them to make sure that the right medications are being put in there and the right quantities are being put in there. 
my mother had Parkinson's disease and she ended up having Parkinson type dementia. And putting your medications like driving is one of the last things you have you can do independently. It's your freedom. Um, so we had a hard time with this one. Uh, so eventually got to the point where she did it and I would come behind her and check to make sure she put the right ones in. And then I would do it and she checked behind me to make sure I was doing it right. That's, that was our agreement. Well, I tell you what, mom, let me do it, but you can check me. And she would go behind and check me, to make sure it was right. I also asked them, do you actually watch the person take the medication? Because if you just sit, say, oh, here they are, send down and go on, there's no guarantee that they've actually taken them. And the only way you know is if you actually see them swallow them. My mother's a good example. Again, she always had a Kleenex in her hand. She got her dementia. If I wasn't watching, the pills I just gave her got into that Kleenex, the way it went. Never took them. So again, you, got, you ask those questions. Again, we said, who picks up the refills? That's very important on who we know is actually picking up the refills. And do they chew or crush the meds? Yes or no. We ask if there's any, when we're going through the initial visit where the, everybody's there, the provider, myself, the nurse, the uh, social worker, they talk about their concerns and why they're there, or the patient talks about their concerns, why we're there. And if they talk about medication concerns at that point, we'll write them here. Or if they have concerns in general, we'll, we'll include those concerns, especially if it relates to behaviors or forgetting things. Um, in the, the magic wand question, are there any changes at this point? And, my answer was, I want to get rid of everything that's not needed. If you're on antihypertensives, I'm going to ask you, are you taking your blood pressure at home? And if you're not, I'm going to tell you to take it at least twice a week. My feeling is most of us suffer from some degree of white coat syndrome. And if we only are relying upon the blood pressures taken at our doctor's office, there's a good chance that they might be elevated. Um, my personal story is with my doctor is I have to hand him I go in every six months, a list of my blood pressures, because when I go to his office, we usually start at about 170 over 90 something. And by the time I leave, it's 140 over 80 something. Because I'm just, that stress getting from my office, going down into the roads, going to his office, knowing he's going to tell me my blood pressure is elevated. It is. So by the end of the appointment, it's down. And then I take him my blood pressures, which show him that normally they're normal and we don't have to worry about it. So that's why I ask of you all, the more numbers you have, the better we are at treating your blood pressure. If you have two blood pressures and one's elevated, what are we gonna do? We're gonna increase your medicine or put you on something else. If we have 25 blood pressures and one's elevated, what are we gonna do? Nothing, I'll follow it. I read here. Blood sugars, if you're on insulin or oral agents, um, we're going to ask you, are you taking your blood sugars at home at least weekly, once a day, whatever, depending on how long you've been on them? Because there again, if you're re relying upon a doctor the office, to do that. It's not going to work. They should be doing A1Cs on you at least every six months or yearly to see what your average blood sugars were for a three-month period, because that's more accurate. And then based upon that, we're going to make decisions. You should always ask your physician, if you're on antihypertensives, you need to ask him what his blood pressure goal for you is. Is it 130 over 80, 140 over 90, 150 over 90, based upon your age, your comorbidities? Because when you're taking your blood pressure at home, you need to know that. Am I in range or am I outside the range? And that makes a difference. Same way with blood sugars and A1Cs. You need to ask your doctor what he's trying to get your A1C to. Because there's nobody in this room that meets the current guidelines for an A1C. 5.5, 7. Most guidelines for, for patients over the age of 65 say an A1C of 8 is acceptable. So if you're at 7.1 and he's bumping up your meds and you're not feeling good, you need to go back and oh, wait a minute here. That guy pharmacist told me that A1C of 8 is okay. In your ninth decade of life, and more multiple, multiple comorbidities, an A1C of 9 to 10 may be acceptable because at that point in time, it's quality of life. You're not going to prevent anything at that point, more of a quality of life issue. So you really need to know what your doctor is trying to achieve. We also do an anticholinergic cognitive burden score on you. Anticholinergic medicines interfere with the brain. 
causes mental, mental slowing, mental clouding, it causes anxiety, it causes agitation, it causes you to be drowsy, sleepy. It's the, the thing where when they say you can't pee, you can't spit, do the anticholinergic effects, the drying up those medicines. If you're on denepazil, it totally, completely interacts with the denepazil. They work two different ways in the brain. So there's the potential if you're taking an anticholinergic and you're on denepazil, you may not be getting full effect of that medication to help with your memory. So it's very important. So we look at those things for you, okay? And for me, you'll see, I would have gotten a score of two, which is good. Anything under three is okay. And I got a point for the furosemide and the metaprolol that you've not seen yet. We also do a medication fall risk score, which medications either due to hypotension, hypoglycemia, interfering with mental cognition, making you have a little bit more ability to control your, your limbs and your arms and your legs, put you at an increased risk for falls. We look at that as well for you. With the meds that I'm on, we'll see them in a few minutes. My fall risk score would have been 13, which is at risk or falls just due to my medications, not anything else that's going on. Um, I've gotten three points, which is the max because of the dilantin that I'm on. If you're on four, four more meds, you're at a greater risk for falls, so I got credit for that. I got two points each for the amlodipine, which is an antihypertensive and the metaprolol, because of the increased risk for hypotension, and a point each for the furosemide, genuvia, and the, and the metformin, I'm sorry, on there. Um, because of, again, of the effects on blood sugar. So you'll get that score as well, and the providers will get that score as well. And this is usually, if we see these numbers really elevated, this is the first place we try to make change in someone's med review or their medication so we can lower these risks. We go back and we ask, and we find out what your prior medical history is. So for me, I have hypertension, type two diabetes with retinopathy, I have BPH, I have AFib, I have a seizure disorder, I have mild cognitive impairment, I have arthritis, and I, and I have gout. We look to go see if there's any, been any recent labs done. Um, my renal function is up a little bit, but not too bad. BUN's 32, creatinine's 1.6. My estimated creatinine clearance is 39 mils per minute. My A1C is 72%, which is really good. My dilantin level is 18.2. My albumin is 3.6, and this is important. These are things that we look for. This drug, Dilantin, which is a seizure medicine, is highly protein bound. Up to about 90% of that drug is bound to plasma proteins, primarily albumin. When it's bound to that albumin, it produces no pharmacological effect in the body at all. Only the free unbound drug does that. This is a measure of both, bound and unbound. If you correct this, and it's a theoretical equation that has its problems, but if you correct for the albumin, which is, um, which is a little bit low, my actual total phenytoin concentration is 22. That pushes me over the normal range. The normal range is 10 to 20. So that means I may be at an increased risk for some adverse effects for that medication. So if I'm seeing drowsiness, decreased appetite, more agitation, more anxiety, and some other things that's, that's affecting your brain, it might be this. And the way you do that is you either convince the, the physician to cut back on the dose to you where when you, the score now falls between 10 and 20, or you get what's called a free phenytoin level. And that normal range is between one and two. If it's greater than two, then you're toxic. Your levels are too high. That's the only other way to do that. So theoretically, if I'm having any problems that are involved with my, my brain or, or even with my heart, it could be to this, to this level. Uric acid is 2.8. That's for my gout because when your uric acid level is up, that's what causes the gout to occur. And cholesterol, normal, all the, the lipids are, are fine. The cholesterol was 100. Your triglycerides were 62. Your HDL was 72 and the LDLC was 70. So your lipids are probably better controlled than mine are right now, this person's would be. The HDL is the one that you want as high as you can. And you can read online how to increase your HDL. That's the one that takes all the other lipids to the liver to get rid of. 
So you want that one up. You want all the other ones down. So basically, the, the person's lipids here are fine. Um, their sodium and potassium are okay. So there's no other real problems with that. My drug list, I've left out a couple. And again, I don't know how I did that. Metaprolol, 25 milligrams twice a day. It's a beta blocker used primarily for heart failure. They have AFibs. So we can be using it for rate control as well. Amlodipine 10 for blood pressure. Urosemide is for blood pressure. If you have any lower extremity edema, it may help with that. Then we talked about the Dunlantin seizures, atorvastatin. Um, I should have um, hyperlipidemia on here as well. Um, CoQ10, again, we'll talk about that one separately. Salt palmetto, we're using it because of a past history of prostatic hypertrophy. It picks a band five milligrams twice a day to reduce the risk of clots from the AFib, having a stroke. Uh, Prevagen daily, omega-3, 1,000 milligrams daily. Advil PM, one to two at bedtime. Metformin, 1,000 milligrams twice a day. Genuvia, 100. Malpurinol, 300. Also on that list should be aspirin, 81 milligrams. And also denepazil, 10 milligrams at bedtime. I left those off. And why I did. We'll look at those drugs and we'll, and we'll talk about them. Like I so said, I would go through every one of those and ask you if you knew what they were used for. And come to find out that the aspirin 81 is, you know, I saw a commercial one day on TV that they said everybody take 81 milligrams of aspirin. And Bayer Laboratories back in the 70s and 80s did a really good job convincing everybody in this country that we need to be on it. Also, looking at the, at the denepazil, we could look at that. We asked him about the CoQ10, and he goes, I really don't know why I'm on CoQ10. The doctor put me on at the same time as he put me on. The, the medication for the atorvastatin for my hypercholesterolemia. Well, CoQ10 is added sometimes because atorvastatin and any of the statins can cause problems with aching pains. Um, so they, they think that if you put CoQ10 on, that's going to prevent that from occurring. There's nothing in the literature that states that works at all for that. So again, we would question that. Saul Palmetto, his next door neighbor, his buddy says he's on it for his prostate problems. So I decided to start taking it. The doctor doesn't even know I'm on it. I'm on it. Prevagen, again, omega-3, all through those. So as we go through those, and as we talk to the person, their, their concerns were they feel lightheaded, they're dizzy, they're starting to forget conversations, forgetting to take their medications and bruising. So we would go through and we would talk about those. We would see what medications they were on, it might be causing those problems, what things we could do. We go through this list of meds and we look for major drug interactions. We don't look for moderate drug interactions or minor ones. It's the major ones we're really concerned about. So with this person, there were five. The aspirin and the apixaban increase the risk for bleeding. The ibuprofen and the apixaban increase the risk for bleeding. The ibuprofen and the aspirin increase the risk for bleeding. So now that ties back into where he said he's having bruising. Could be nothing more than a drug interaction with what he's on that's increasing his risk for bleeding or not clotting as quickly. The fish oil can also do that. The salt palmetto can also do that as well. So we're looking for those types of things. The denepazil and amlodipine, it may actually, the denepazil may decrease the effectiveness of the amlodipine, which means your blood pressure may not be as well controlled. So we would be looking for that as well. With the denepazil, we would ask them, since you've taken it, are you having any problems sleeping at night? Are you having any problems with nightmares? Because we take it at bedtime to get away from some of the other side effects that this medication causes. By the time you get up in the morning, those are probably gone away. We will have people that'll say, hey, now that you mentioned that, I'm not sleeping real well. Or I've been having these really bizarre dreams all of a sudden. It's probably the denepazil. We tell them instead of quit taking it in, the, in bedtime, take it in the morning. Magically go away. The amlodipine causes your vessels to dilate. That's the way it does that. But when it's throwing your blood pressure, but when you do that, you get lower extremity edema. So we're looking for that. So if I see the amlodipine in the diuretic, I'm going to ask them which came first. 
So our amlodipine first, and we added the furosemide second because of edema, it's probably due to the, am the amlodipine, and we're gonna, we're gonna switch the amlodipine to something else. The metoprolol, that's the fast acting. We're gonna switch it to the long acting 50 milligrams once a day. Makes it much easier for you. It's one less medication you have to take in a day. Simplifies the measurements. Amlodipine we talked about, furosemide. I'm making sure that you're taking the furosemide in the morning, not in the late afternoon or evening. If you are, you're probably up at night going to the bathroom. And we do have people that take it that way. A torvastatin, again, that's max dose. Uh, you're increasing your for side effects. I'm 78. My lip is really good. I don't have a history of stroke. I would go back and say, hey, would you be willing to cut this dose in half to 40 milligrams? Decrease the risk. Still should keep your lipids well within. CoQ10, let's get rid of it. There's nothing out there that says it works at all on anything. Plus, we don't know the side effects of those medications. We don't study them. They're over the counter, they're supplements. Same way with the salt palmetto. You can pick up the literature. There is nothing anywhere that suggests that this drug works for BP. So we would get rid of it. A pixaban for the AFib to prevent strokes, that's the normal dose, and that's fine. But people who are over the age of 80, their serum creatinine is 1.5 or more, and this one is 1.6, or they're less than 60 kilo kilograms, which is 132 pounds, they can decrease the dose to 2.5 twice a day, get the same beneficial effect as preventing strokes, and decrease the risk for bleeding because you're decreasing the dose. So we'd be going back and saying, hey, let's decrease the dose. Prevagen, my bias, that's the first thing to go. Um, we have medications that are prescription that have been studied for years and years and years that don't really do anything for the process itself. So why would this over-the-counter product do anything for you. And I'll ask people, I said, since you've started taking that, have you seen a, have you seen a real significant change? No, not really. Then why are you still taking it? Sense it. It doesn't really work. Even the medications we have really don't do a whole lot for you. In the normal process of dementia, in Alzheimer's, there's over 100 different types of dementia. We say Alzheimer's because that's the most prominent one, but not every dementia is Alzheimer's dementia, other types of dementia. But as you go through dementia, you'll have a plateau, you'll have a falling period, plateau, falling period, till the end. What our current drugs do pretty much is they take a period of time when you start taking it and they stabilize you for 12 to 18 months. So you don't see this. It's sort of like a straight line. You'll have a couple little blips. But as you get through that period, you'll start to see the fall again. When you get to that point or when you're dealing with someone who's no longer able to really feed themselves, they have to be set up, they're not able to bathe themselves, you have to dress them, then these medications really aren't useful anymore. And we ask to get rid of them. And but we do it slowly. You can't take someone off that medication cold turkey because you'll see some behavioral issues that you never saw before. So we're looking for those types of things as well. The pre we talked about the omega-3. Again, it's questionable for its effects on your lipids. And then the studies were at 4,000 milligrams, not 1,000. So 1,000 is probably not doing a whole lot for you. You're already on statin. Why are we taking this medication? It also can increase the risk for bleeding and other interactions. So we would look to take care of Get rid of that one as well. Advil PM, why are you taking the Advil? And they say, well, I have a hard time sleeping at night. I have a lot of pain. I've got arthritis. Ah, okay. If you've got OA or you've got arthritis and you have routine pain daily, you need to be taking routine Tylenol. Start. Routine pain, routine pain meds. 500 milligrams a couple times a day, three times a day up to maybe three grams a day, see if that works for you. PRN Tylenol is for that sudden acute pain where you take the hammer and you smash it against your thumb. That's where you only take the PRN Tylenol. Ibuprofen, again, stomach irritation, 
cause GI bleeds, it intera interacts with the apixaban. Also, anybody know what this PM is? This Advil PM, anybody know what the PM is? Or is that just the name? It's the name. Ah, okay, no, good, good try though. This PM means that there's Benadryl in there to help you sleep, diphenhydramine. It's a first generation medication for those type of conditions. Anticholinergics. We just got done saying that anticholinergics are not good for you. This one is especially not good for you, okay? You take 50 milligrams of that, because right now for adults or older people, they're really saying 12.5 to 25. Back when I was growing up, you could take 50 to 100 milligrams. You take 50 milligrams of that drug and tell me you don't feel hungover in the morning. Now you put that on top of somebody who has some early cognitive impairments, it makes it worse. You can't remember anything. You're at more risk for falls. It's terrible. So when you go to your pharmacy and you're buying these products, you need to ask them, does this have any antihistamines in it? Does it have anything that causes anticholinergic side effects? And they better answer you. They better take the time to answer you. That's why they're there. If they do, you don't want to take this, okay? So again, you look for things that have anticholinergic, antihistamines in them. Some of the newer ones are not as sedating, but they still do cause some degree of sedation. But they're a little bit better than the old stuff. So again, we would be really questioning why are we using that? Can we switch to something else that probably won't cause the side effects with the brain? and hopefully get a better control on the pain. Metformin, 1,000 milligrams twice a day. That's a normal dose. That's a good healthy dose, but it's within dosing. But we said that my creatinine clearance is 39. For creatinine clearance between 30 and 44, this dose needs to be no more than 500 milligrams twice a day because it hangs around in the body for a really long time, and it's going to increase your risk for hypoglycemia. A1C looks good. We'll say his random blood sugars look good. We would be asking to cut this down to 500 milligrams twice a day. If you're on this drug and your creatinine clearance falls less than 30, we'll probably leave you on it. We're going to really look at it. We'll probably lower the dose. If you've never been on this drug before and your creatinine clearance falls below 30, we don't even start it anymore. Hangs around in the body too long. Genuvia, 100 milligrams is the dose they studied to get any reduction in A1C. At this renal function, the max dose you should be getting is 50 milligrams. So that would be coming off as well. This is the bias on my part. It's one of the agents that gives the least amount of oomph to decrease this A1C. It's still brand, so it costs a lot. So you don't really get your bang for your buck. So that would be coming off immediately. We would be talking about that one. Dalapurinol, 300 milligrams daily. Okay. We would go back. I've got a history of gout, but my A1C is 2.8. I would ask you, when was the last time you had a gouty attack? When was the last time you were bothered by your gout? And if you go back and say, hmm, that's a good question. You know, I really don't know. We would be going back and we'd be messing with the stoves. One, because you're asymptomatic. You don't remember when your last attack was. But again, your creatinine, your, um, that's, your creatinine clearance is 39. Again, if your creatinine clearance is between 30 and 45, this needs to be 50 milligrams max. No more. So we would be decreasing because you're asymptomatic and because your renal function says we need to be decreasing the stoves. If it's less than 30, you don't even do this, this drug at all. I also asked a question. Have you ever been on a drug called hydrochlorothiazide, HCTZ, hydrochloril, Esadrex? And I'm looking for a yes. If I get a yes, they probably don't need to be on me, especially if they're older. Hydrochlorothiazide, the way it works, increases uric acid levels in your body which is gonna predispose you to gout. Remember, I started working in a pharmacy when I was 12. Hydrochlorothiazide now is dosed between 6.25 to 25 milligrams a day. When I was growing up, 
it was 100 to 150 milligrams a day. I would love to be able to go back now, knowing what I know, and check those people, because I wonder how many of those people who are getting their hydrochlorothiazide prescription filled were also getting their allopurinol filled because of their gout. It was because of the, the diuretic that we were So again, I go back, and I found a couple of those. Yeah, I used to take that all day. Oh, that's, you don't need it anymore. But the Lantin, we would be looking at as well, not only because of its levels, but my question would be, when was the last time you had a seizure? Is this the only medication you've been on? Have you been on multiple medications? Because if they say, no, this is the only been the drug I've been on, or they can't answer, but their son or daughter says, yeah, they said mom had seizures. I've never seen mom have a seizure. And he's 42 years old. The son's 42 years old or the daughter. They don't need to be on the medication. Or they'll come back and say, yeah, mom had pneumonia when she was seven in the hospital and she had a seizure then. The pneumonia caused the seizure. Don't need to be on it. I had a stroke there for a while, 15, 20 years ago. If you had a stroke, neurologist puts you on Dilantin because there's some indication that you may have a seizure status post stroke. That's been found that's probably not the case. Or if you do use it, it should only be for a couple of weeks or maybe a couple of months. And if you've not had a seizure, you take them off. Well, like everything else, it's on there. It stays on there year after year after year. So again, no recent seizure activity. We would start taking this medic medication off again, but slowly. Studies show that if you do it over a five to six month period, you decrease the risk of relapse by 50 to 60%. So we would go from 300 to 60 for a month, to 30 for a month, to 100 for a month, 160 for a month, 130 for a month, and 100. We would stop at that point. Because somewhere, this titration down, this tapering, you've went below in, which is what you need to have any type of decent seizure control. That's the normal rate. So we're way, way below that. So at 100 milligrams, we just stop it. I can truthfully tell you, I've been doing this for a long time, and I've taken a lot of people off of Dilantin, and I only know of two people who've ever seized after I took them off. One was an unwitnessed seizure, which maybe or maybe not. The other person had a seizure, and three days later, we diagnosed her with having a urinary tract infection. The UTI probably caused the seizure. Never had any more out. So we're looking at that. And this is really a, what we see a lot of. This is normal meds. I'm not trying to pick stuff out to, to drive a point here. These are things that you normally see. So we would be looking at making changes to decrease the amount of meds you're on, maybe make you more compliant, reduce the risk for drug interactions and side effects from occurring. If you're on multiple antihypertensives, then we, again, we'll be looking to see what your blood pressures were. Because we're, especially if you're complaining about feeling a little confused, a little dizzy, a little wobbly during the day or when you get up, that's probably what you're experiencing is orthostatic hypotension. Your blood, as we go from sitting to standing, our blood pressure drops normally. But when we're younger, we're, our body's able to kick in through what we need to get it back up fairly quickly. As we get older, that doesn't happen. And those blood pressures, blood pressures tend to drop, stay down for a little bit. So we're looking for orthostatic hypotension. We're looking, again, for you to come back and tell me, hey, Barry, I've been taking my blood pressure at home. And that top number, that systolic number is anywhere between 98 and 105 or 106. And that bottom number, the diastolic is anywhere between 58 and 70. We're going to be decreasing your meds. because That's probably what's causing your problem. And then we would be telling you to do some orthostatic blood pressure checks at home, see what changes occurring in that top number and bottom. So that's what we would be doing there. After we set and go through all this, is again, I can't do anything. I ask you all, are you in agreement? If you're in agreement, then we're going to pursue it. If you say, nah, Barry, nice try. I don't buy it. Then that's fine too. We're not going to make any of those suggestions. But if you do, and like I said before, with Riverside, it's fairly easy because I can send them something directly, but for the others, I can't do that. As we're writing, or as we fi finish up, I have a sheet that I didn't put up here that I, I put the priority recommendation, recommendations to discuss with the provider. So everything that we talk about, everything we talk about there goes on this form. It's yours. So when you go to your doctor, whenever you can say, hey, Barry should have sent you something. And if you can't find it, here's what he wanted to do. 
So he can't say that he never saw it or they can, can't say they never saw it. It's right here for you. And any other recommendations I, I might have. So you walk out with this, so you have something. It's everything we discussed. We have the form which, which actually shows you what we use in our calculations to do our anticholinergic cognitive burden scale, the medications that do that, I didn't have it out there, and also the medications that do fall. So we have that, and it's a standard form. They're out there in, in the literature. There's different ones, but like this one for a while, and they periodically change it. So I have to go back and redo the form. Okay. Also, when you come and visit me or, or Dr. Purdy, my, my colleague, we will ask you to fill out a survey while you're in the office or anytime you see us. And we want you to do it there. You can do it in front of me. You can take it out in the lobby and do it. It needs to be done there. It's, circled, it's circling the answer. It's a minute at the most and leave it. Because if I get a survey and I take it home, it never makes it out of my truck most of the time until I have a pile of papers like that and then I just throw them away. So I don't want it mailed. I want it done. And the other reason is, I want to see what you say. And I usually I go back after every couple of weeks and just pull them out and look at them. How you're truly evaluating me. This, this is our time together. This is our moment. And if I'm not reaching you, I need to know why I'm not reaching. Because if I'm not reaching you, I'm probably not reaching somebody else. So I really want you to fill this out honestly. Like I said, I'm pretty thick skinned. I've been around for a long time. So it would take a really a lot to hurt my feelings and it probably wouldn't hurt my feelings. But again, I want to know if I'm in a rut and I do a lot of these and I've done over the years, I do get in ruts. We all get in ruts. If I'm in one and I need to get out of it, you need to tell me that. So we look at these and then we make changes where we need to make them. So you would see one of these as well. Coming into this presentation today, have I met your needs? Have I sort of answered your questions? Have I sort of quenched your thirst for what I might be going to present today? Or have I missed something? Did you come in with something else that you totally want to see? Because if I can do that within 10 minutes, we'll do it. Yes, sir. Did they, did they hear that? Okay. The question was for, for an older person, what's the best pain medication to take? And the gentleman's States he does take it very often, but he, but he does use a leave periodically. Um, again, I think non-steroidals used infrequently are fine. I think if you use them a lot, they're not because of the stomach and the problems they, they cause. They also have effect on your kidneys as well. So if you're taking them a lot, you can be causing some damage to your, your kidneys as well. I like Tylenol. Um, I like make it routine, especially in people who have chronic pain, like we talked about before, but trying to keep it about no more than two grams a day, um, usually 653 times a day, or I'll tell them to take two 500s in the morning and two 500s right before bed. So that, that way they, they get a good night's sleep. Because again, high doses of Tylenol can also affect your kidneys and, and your liver. So you don't want to go over four grams for any period of time. So I try to keep them about two grams, maybe three. I'll go higher to get them under pain control. Then we'll bump the dose down a little. But I think, so think non-steroidals are fine if they're only used very infrequently. Yes. Um, we have a few online questions. Okay. Um, do you work with the Choose Home program? My office is actually at where Choose Home is in Williamsburg, off of McCall. I, I work in their geriatric assessment center, and that's in the same building, same office suite. Um, and another question was, what is the difference between morbidity and mortality? Morbidity is due to the disease itself and what it can cause. Mortality is when you actually die. Yeah. Right. Okay, let's, let's address this two ways. If it's an over-the-counter product or a supplement, that decision is up to you, not your doctor. If it's a prescription medicine and I've convinced you that I'm right, you have a right to tell your doctor that you don't want to take this medication or you want to take less. Now, they may tell you no, or you need to go find another doctor, and I'm not going to change it. But you, as a patient, have the right to sort of control what you're doing, not him or them. Um, we, unfortunately, I, I want them to agree with me all the time, and they don't. We track that. Um, 
the number with Riverside, we're probably close to about 50% of the doctors doing what we want or, or some part of it. Uh, doctors outside of Riverside, it's about 40% or so. Um, and I, I think a lot of it too has to do just with the fact of the time between when we see you and the time that you may actually have your next doctor's appointment. Because again, I'm a consultative service just as, as is GAC. So everything we talk about in that office gets faxed to them. So does it get lost? Where does it go? So I think some of that has to do, hopefully, with just the fact that that information sometimes gets lost. That's why we give you that sheet when you walk out that talks about the things that we've discussed. Yes, ma'am. Okay. The, que the question was, what do I think about over-the-counter over the counter vitamins, vitamin D, and, and those things, vitamin C? Um, again, I think if there are multiple answers, I think if there is a true deficiency, you're found that your vitamin D levels are low or your vitamin B12 levels are low or your calcium, then yeah, I, I think that's good to correct the deficiency. Uh, I think if there's not a, a deficiency, you really don't need to take it, okay? Or just to, to the levels go up, get up. Um, I, I believe in vitamin C. Uh, Linus, Paul, Linus Pauling, believed in vitamin C. He was a very intelligent, brilliant physician and scientist. And he used to tell people you take enough, during cold and flu season, you took enough vitamin C to when you went to the bathroom, you smelled like an orange. And then you cut back. And he said that I either tend to cut it down a few days or maybe prevent it. I think vitamin C is not going to hurt you as long as it's no more than a thousand milligrams a day. And if you're prone to infections or that stuff, and you think it helps, then I would I would take it. Multivitamins, studies show that if you eat two good meals a day, you normally will get everything you need. You don't need a multivitamin. Now, if you're a person that calls breakfast a piece of toast and a cup of tea and lunch, half a sandwich, then you probably need a multivitamin. But if you actually eat two good meals a day and your weight's stable and you're good and healthy, you don't need a multivitamin. Any other questions? So when you come to me, be prepared that we're going to take more things off than we add. We, I do add things. I really do. Uh, but I tend to ask to take things away more or cut doses more than I do. And I'm a pharmacist, but that's just who I am. Other questions? Okay, with that, there's no other questions. Thank you all for listening and thank you for actually in attendance. I appreciate it, thank you.